Man, I'm glad you're here. My name is Philip. I am the worship pastor here. So I'm one of the pastors, but because I do the worship, that means I'm kind of in charge of the creative side, which also means I get to wear awesome hats. So you're welcome. Um, we're in this series called A Life Worth Living, and we're talking about how a life worth living really, I mean, we all want a good life, don't we? A life worth living maintains perspective. Do you believe that? What I mean by that is that everything in life is affected by how you look at it. So perspective, if you will, perspective is everything, right? I don't know if you're, and also, by the way, we're going to be in Philippians 3 and 4. If you want to go there in your Bible, we'll be there the whole morning, okay? So you can do that right now. I don't know if you're like me. You're probably not because I'm a little bit different, but I get on these things called kicks. You guys ever do that? Like, you're just on a kick. My wife will say, like, oh, no. He's on a kick again. And usually for me, it happens with a vehicle. I'm, I've lived here in California for three years, and I have officially owned 18 vehicles. That's no joke. That's motorcycles, cars. But what I do is I have this dream that I'm going to buy this old thing. I'm going to paint it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to sell it. Sometimes I win. Sometimes I lose. We'll, for now, just say that I'm always winning, okay? Okay. But I just do that. I get on a kick. And, and I, don't, I don't know why this happens, but for a while, you'll feel like everything's like in order, and then all of a sudden, something happens, and it sparks the kick. You know what I'm talking about? For instance, do we have anybody in here that drives a Honda Accord? Anybody? Yes, one. Your lights are not on, okay? You're good. But if you drive, man, one person out of this whole room with a Honda Accord? Okay, maybe a few. You're just shy. Okay, let's just say I'm going to dream with you, okay, right now that it's a tooth. I'm, I'm I'm like connecting with you. It's a 2003 Honda Accord, 175,000 miles. This Accord is ready for the next 175,000 miles because the Honda Accord is the most reliable car, right? Everybody knows that. All right, so here's the deal. Let's say you're a Honda Accord owner. Let's say I'm a Honda Accord owner, and I'm driving to, to work every day. Let's say it's 15, 20 minutes. Things are great. I am a proud owner. I drive this car. It does everything it's supposed to. I don't ever worry about it. I rotate the tires. Until one day I wake up in the morning, and I'm sure you never do this. You never do this. But I have a cup of coffee, and I sit down, and I open up my Instagram feed for like, and I'm sure you, you don't do this, but like maybe five to 45 minutes. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, you're sitting there scrolling through, and now it might be 50 minutes because now we got to look at everybody's story. we got to watch them walk their dog at sunset and all that stuff. So it's 45 minutes, and then all of a sudden this ad pops up, and it's for a 2018 Ford F-150 with brown leather seats because black leather is like 2005. So this one has the brown leather seats. It's got everything. It's got those aggressive wheels. It's got all of it. And it's all speaking to me, all from this Instagram photo. One photo. Now, here's what happens. I'm like, man, good thing I drive in a cord. Like, no big deal, right? Until it, like, like ignites this little thing in my mind. And then now I'm driving to work 15, 20, 30 minutes. Now all, now you never do this, I know, but all I see are Ford F-150s <laughs> everywhere, right? I mean, they're everywhere. I'm looking, I come home and I'm like, baby, Ford F-150s, like they're selling tons of them. They're everywhere. And my wife's like, not again, you know? But the, the thing is, is what changes? What's the difference from before when you didn't even notice that there was a Ford truck on the road until now? Your perspective changed because that ad popped up and it, Triggered a little like, wait a minute, things are different. Now my Honda Accord is not as good as it used to be, even though it's the same car. You don't believe me? How many of you, you got your phone, and you think it's great until September rolls around, which is right now, and Apple, you know they're going to come out with that thing where they're going to do the new phone, and all of a sudden your phone is like twice as heavy as it used to be. You're like, man, this phone, it's just not cutting it anymore. It's slow, it's small, it's heavy. It's just holding me down, okay? Okay. The same thing. I don't, now, I'm guilty of this one. How many of you guys ever go on diets and all you see is skinny people? It's like, oh, another one. Another one. What are they like, Sherry splitting a cracker over there? You know, they're just hungry thinking about it. So the, the, the point that I'm trying to make, I hope you're hearing this, is that perspective really does change our minds. It's a way to live and it genuinely changes everything. So check out Philippians 3 if you're already there. If not, it's up on the screens and we'll read this together. This is, oh, you got to know this before we do this. 
This is a letter. So Philippians is a letter written by Paul, okay? Now, the most important thing that you need to remember for everything else in this message to make sense is that Paul is in prison when he wrote this, okay? So he's in prison basically for being a Christian. There's a group of Christians that are kind of worried about him. So they send this guy named Epaphroditus to come give him a financial gift. I don't know why he needs a financial gift in prison. Jonathan's the smarter pastor. He'll know that. You'll have to ask him about that. But all I know is that it'll be a financial gift that they're bringing to him. And so the letter of Philippians is actually Paul in jail, if you can imagine this, writing out this like, thanks for the financial gift. And this is my letter back to you. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Check this out. Philippians 3, starting in verse 12, it says, I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. That doesn't sound like a guy in jail to me, right? Okay, are you still with me? All right, good answer, 15. It says, so let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, I want that. If any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, that God will clear your blurred vision and you'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Now, that looks like a guy, that sounds like a guy who's riding from Disneyland or somewhere, anywhere other than prison. But the thing is, Paul has this like superhuman way of dealing with life. And how many of you guys would love to have that? Yeah. Okay, so to to illustrate this, I want to use a little bit of an example. I'm going to come off the stage here. I know, it's scary. I won't touch anybody. I wouldn't want to be touched. So I'm going to come back here. By the way, this is our tech team. Everybody say thank you or give them a hand. This is, this is Kurt. He's holding a crowbar with a rope, okay? And uh, so I'm going to just take this rope. You guys okay with that? I hope it's not tangled, Kurt. All right. So I, if any of you guys have been Christians watching that Christian YouTube, you've probably seen this illustration on YouTube, so don't judge me. But because Francis Chan did this about 10 years ago. Now, let's just imagine. Now, this is a nice yellow rope. Kurt, you're going to want to pick that up again. I didn't tell you this. But we're just going to imagine. Are you guys imagining that this rope goes on and on for eternity forever? I mean, this is a big rope. It's a yellow rope. It's a large rope. And it's just going. All right. Now, I could do this all day. But just imagine that it goes past Kurt. It goes all the way around this room. This rope reaches all the way around El Dorado Hills. It loops its way around the United States back and forth. It goes all the way around the world a hundred times. Okay, 101 times. It goes all the way around the world. It goes to, no, it can't go to the sun. It would burn. It comes back. And this rope, are you getting the picture? It goes on for what? Eternity. Now, This rope is just a small way that we can try to get our minds around eternity. Because here's the thing. All of us are eternal souls. If you don't believe me, look at John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should should not perish but have what? Eternal life. So imagine this. How many parents do we have in here? A lot? Okay, some parents. When you have a child, you are given the opportunity to create an eternal soul. Wrap your mind around that. This entity, this thing that you have made is an eternal being. We are eternal beings. But here's the thing. All we know is what we see, right? So all I can comprehend in my small brain, in my awesome hat, all I can comprehend is what I see and what's right in front of me. But somehow Paul got out of that, and he lived his life with eternity in view. Here's the way a lot of us, myself included, tend to live our lives. Imagine that this little red tape right here, okay? You see it? Imagine that this is your life right now. Let's say you're lucky. Hopefully we all make it to age 85. If you're in here and you're past 85, 
You did it. Congratulations. Let's say we make it as far. Let's just say this represents 85 years old for me. I spend all of my life, we spend all our lives so wrapped up, so caught up in this little bitty red tape life. Everything's so important in here. I mean, like, that, that $5 extra per month, like, that's so important in here. Oh, that guy that was mean to me, oh, that's so important over here. Oh, that kid that I can't get to behave, it's so important right here. But you know what Paul did? He's sitting in prison, and his mind is not looking at this. Paul's perspective is on all of this, and he says, I, here's the best, I love this. I hope that you catch this. Paul did not see his life as just what he saw. He saw it as a lived-out expression. His story, a lived-out expression of Jesus' story. Does that make sense? Jesus was this eternal being, and Jesus was always preparing a place. He had all these things for the future, the future. Jesus was never like, you're right, that matters now. No. Jesus always had his mind forward on eternity. And Paul saw himself like that. And, and also Jesus and Paul are calling us to live our lives with eternity in mind instead of with this in mind. Because here's what happens. People who live in here, they're really stressed out. They're really bothered by things. I mean, just the littlest thing, and they can't stop talking about it. But people who live with eternity in mind, this massive rope, they're crazy in a good way. They're crazy. People who live with eternity in mind, they give things away. People who live like this, they wake up in the morning and they don't think about themselves. They think about everybody else. So the question is, how much time are we investing in this compared to all of that? Are you with me? All right. Good, good. So let me get this off of here so I don't trip. I had to pull the whole thing out, didn't I? There we go. All right. So the first thing that I think Paul was, and, and you guys can probably agree with me, is that he was content. He was actually more content than the people who were, quote, living in freedom all around him. Isn't that weird? Not only that, he was a centered person. Paul was centered. And you might say, well, what's the difference between being centered and being content? And honestly, I think they have a lot of similarities. But a centered person is somebody who has kind of that, I like to think of it in life, kind of like, you know, on the, the, the music shows, they'll say they have the it factor. I think in life, it's like this person, a centered person, they have that it factor. And you're just like, man, how do they do it? I mean, that's what Paul, when I look at Paul, I'm saying, man, this guy is centered. He's an incredible human being. And uh, you know who's centered? I'll tell you who's centered. The person who can rock to sleep the screaming baby. Are you with me? I mean, imagine that. That is a person who can handle all these things coming at him. So let's, let's just say a screaming baby or whatever the thing is that's coming at you. It's an action. It's something that's coming towards you. And a centered person can have the appropriate reaction for whatever action takes place. Does that make sense? I'll, I'll illustrate it another way, okay? Let's just say I couldn't bring this up here because I'm not strong enough. But let's just say I have a giant rock. I mean, this thing is massive. It'd be scary if I was holding it. Let's just say there's a huge rock up here, okay? And that you guys, you're all underwater, by the way, okay, in this imaginary world. I've got this huge rock, you're all underwater, and I just chunk this rock. And it lands right there, and it splashes big, and there's all these ripples, and there's all this stuff happening. It's this massive, awesome thing when I throw this giant rock. And then let's say I just pick up a giant, uh, a tiny little pebble, and I throw it in. And the same thing happens, except for it's smaller. Just little ripples, little waves, little things go like that, okay? What happens in life is a lot of times we get our rocks, you got to stick with me on this, and our ripple or our wave out of order. Meaning, things will come at you, they'll come at me, and all of a sudden, it, we'll treat this little tiny thing, this little bitty thing, we give it, we treat it as if it's this giant rock and it makes this massive splash in our life. Everything's out of order. We got to call somebody. We got to tell somebody. All this over this little tiny thing. And then some of us will have things that should be massive and they land in our lives and we just don't, we don't even notice them. 
We, we don't want to be this way, but the truth is that a lot of times we get this out of order. We get the rock and the ripple or the wave. We get those, those things out of order. A person who's centered gets this right. Paul got this right. Jesus got this right. And you might say, well, why does this matter? I think this is interesting. I attended a conference, a leadership conference a few weeks ago, and they said on the stage, they said, guess what the number one thing employees, what, okay, so there's employees and they're, they're being interviewed on what they, like the kind of boss, that their favorite boss that they've ever been led by, okay, does that make sense? Who, what was the characteristics of the person that, that led them, of this leader, what qualities did they have, okay? And they're asking all these people, they're doing these polls and these different things. The number one thing that people said that they, the characteristic that a leader will have that they want to follow, the number one characteristic is a centered person. And you might be in here today and you're saying, well, I don't lead anybody. I'm a mom or I'm a whatever. Everybody, all of us are leading somebody. Some of you might even be leading the parents who are older than you. We're all leading somebody. Somebody's leading a friend group. Somebody's leading a soccer team. Everybody is looking at you all the time, and they're saying, how are they going to react to this? Or do they look centered? Because if I'm going to follow somebody, they better have their stuff together, right? Paul is one of those people, and his impact, the impact of this centered human being, Paul, a guy in jail, still got his stuff together, the impact is still affecting the church today. Isn't that cool? So I got to ask you guys this morning, what are the rocks in your life? What are the things, what are the boulders, what are the pebbles? What are those things in your life that you'd say are just coming at you? And then I have to ask you, how much attention, how much wave, ripple, how much are you giving to it? Because some of us, we love to take on battles that were never our own. And some of us, and I'm talking about myself here especially, want to take on something. I will fix this because I fix things. That's what I'm going to do. And all the while, I'm frustrated. I'm making huge splashes, huge waves, because this is something that I can conquer because I have it together. I'm going to do this. And all the while, God is standing that over here, and he's saying, that was never your battle to begin with. When are you going to give it to me? And here's what happens. God isn't interested in your glory. He's interested in you. He loves you very much. But he's not interested in saying, wow, Philip, what a great human. Look at that guy. Like, No. He is the center of the universe. All glory goes to God. So whenever there's something in your life that is bigger than you, an obstacle, a mountain, or whatever it is, and you're trying and you're fighting and you're making yourself look dramatic and crazy, God's over here and he says, when you call on me, I will level it. And guess what? The whole world will stand back and say, wow, God is good. Not, wow, Philip is good. So I have to ask you, what are the battles, what are the rocks in your life that were never yours to begin with? And today, think about it. Will you hand it over to God and let go? Look at this. Um, look at this verse. It's Philippians 4, 6. I love this. Paul is saying to these people that sent him the gift do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, be prayerful and petition with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. I mean, this is a guy sitting in a horrible situation, and he's teaching other people about peace. Peace that transcends all understanding, and he's doing it. He is leading from a place where nobody should normally be leading. And it's all possible because his perspective is not on the immediate, it's on the eternal. Cool? All right. Um, when I read that verse, another thing kind of stands out to me, and I just have to speak into this because I think it's 
very practical to where our world is at and where our, our country is at, and that is that we are full of fear and anxiety and depression, and I'd love to just say like some magic word and just like stop being depressed and it just all goes away, but we all know that that's not a real thing. But the truth is, is that we live in a place where there is fear everywhere, where there's anxiety about all kinds of different things, and depression over all kinds of different things. And I have to look at this and I have to say whenever he, whenever he says, but in every situation, be prayerful and, and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts. I mean, that sounds so foreign to me, doesn't it? And so I'm praying about that and I'm thinking about it and I'm realizing that Paul is a guy through perspective, through maintaining perspective, He's a guy that like overcame the biggest mountain that I think holds a lot of us back. And that mountain is that we get stuck in the what ifs. And what I mean by that is situations in our life will come up and we'll just say, well, I'd like to, but what if? I'd like to help that family in need financially, but well, what if I need it? Or I'd like to take that job that I really think God's calling me to, and I'd like to do all these things, and I have this vision, these plans for the future, but, I mean, what if my family doesn't like that, or whatever? Or, you know what, I'd like to not work so hard and come home late and be angry and frustrated and all that. I'd like to not invest 99.9% .9 of my life into my job and then come home and give my 1% of my family, but, but what if they fire me because I'm not giving them everything that I've always given them? And I just want to challenge you today, and maybe this can help you, Paul's example, just play it out in light of eternity, and then ask yourself, am I okay with that? Let's just play it out. Let's just say there's a family across the street, you, dr you walk your dog by their car every day, and you notice the tires on their car are extremely bald, they're like they're dangerous to themselves and to all society, <laughs> you know, people around them. And you know, you know what? They probably, it's a single mom, they probably don't have the money to fix their tires. You know what? I see them spending money on all kinds of other things. They don't deserve me to help them. But maybe God's called you to bless them and just anonymously hook them up with a letter that says, here's your tires, show up at this place at this time. Maybe, but let's just play it out, both sides, okay? Let's play past the what ifs. What if you do? This family could receive the, let's say it's $1,000 to do this tires. That could be just the jump that this family needed to take the next step in their life. Maybe they've been living $1,000 behind for so long, and your small gift for you just changed the trajectory of the next five, six, 10 years of their life. What if they then can't believe you did that for them, and they go and do it for somebody else? I'm just saying, what if? Or let's play the negative. Let's just say, what if you give it to them and, and let's play the negative. Now your tires, you need new tires or your car breaks down, your air conditioner stops working or whatever it may be. And now you're sitting there saying, man, if I only had that thousand dollars, can you handle that? I mean, you answer the question for yourself. Because what you'll probably find 99% of the time is that the negative side is not that bad. I mean, so you gotta roll your windows down. It's not the end of the world. That family got life change, or so now you don't get to go to Maui, you have to go to Tahoe for a week. I mean, like, what if? I mean, just, let's just play it out. It, it, nine times out of 10, it's not as bad as we think it will be. And I, I wanted to read a letter for you guys, that, now, I, before I read this letter, I gotta say that my family, there's a lot of things we get right and there's a lot of things we get wrong. So I'm not trying to be the hero of my own story here, but there is a moment in 2008 where my family came up against major what ifs. And we made a decision, which you'll find out here in a second, but before I do that, a lot of you guys don't even know my family, so I thought it'd be fun to put them on the screen and introduce you to them, okay? So check this out, we'll throw this up there. Okay, that's Nathan, say hi, Nathan. And the photo bomb is Mandy in the back, the giraffe, we don't know him. All right, let's hit the next one. That is my son, Spencer, the oldest, he's 16. Cool, 
And I'm proud of him there, by the way. Can you see it? He's in Mexico, just built homes for people. Like, that was a proud moment. Okay, let's hit the next one. This is Mandy at fifth grade graduation. How cool is that with her little flowers? And then that's Spencer there. Let's hit another one. I think there's like two more. Okay, that's them burning their homework at the end of fifth grade. That's like a family ritual for us. We burn it at the end of every year. It's exciting. All right, that's us with it. That's my wife, Kristen. That's a filter. It made us look tan. No joke. It's an Instagram filter. We're not that tan, but that's my wife, Kristen, with her hippie glasses. All right, let's do another one. And that is Stu, the meathead dog. We love that guy. Um, anyway, so what you do know, what most people don't know about us is that even if you do know our family, is that the youngest two kids, Mandy and Nathan, that we adopted them in 2008. So Spencer is biologically ours. We had him naturally. And another cool thing is that Mandy and Nathan, the two youngest one, the one with the giraffe and one with the photo bomb, that one, those two are biological siblings. So they are actually siblings by birth. And in 2008, we adopted them. And something kind of interesting is Spencer was about three, I believe, whenever we started kind of thinking this was something that God might be calling us to. And we went through all these different things. We went the infant adoption route where you say, okay, there's going to be somebody who's pregnant, but they, they don't feel like they can raise the kid and they want somebody else to raise them. And it came to find, like, we kept hitting dead ends and, and there's, like, lines of people and all these things. And it just, seemed, it just didn't seem right for us. It's right for a lot of people, but it didn't seem right for us. And we went through this process for two years until one day we look around, Spencer's five years old, and we're like, wait a minute, I don't want an infant, do you? And Kristen's like, no, they cry, they don't sleep, like, that, what are we thinking? You know, why would we, and it was just kind of weird, I'm making the light of it, but it was a real decision where we decided, you know what, let's, in, let's look into adopting kids that aren't infants. So that led us into Child Protective Services, which is kids who have been removed for whatever um, dangerous situation or whatever situation that they come from. Now, what's kind of weird is when you adopt, I mean, when you have a child on your own biologically, a lot of you guys know this, it's real easy. Like, well, it's not like easy, you know, like the kid, you know, but it's easy to, it's easy to make the announcement. All you have to do is call mom or somebody and you're just like, we're pregnant. And the high-pitched scream begins. Phone, like Within 15 minutes, everything's out. Everybody knows. Everybody's just going nuts. But what happens whenever you decide to adopt, and believe me, we have very, very supportive family, but when you adopt, the first thing that comes in is what ifs. All these questions, well, have you thought about? And these are supportive people that want this to happen, but, they ha but we all want to ask the questions, right? But what if, what if, what if, what if? And so as a way of announcing that we finally decided to do this, my wife Kristen wrote this letter um, that we then emailed out to family and friends to kind of let them know. And what's crazy is I just showed you us in 2018 I mean, we're not perfect, believe me. If you could be a fly on the wall, you'd be like, ooh, that was disappointing. But all in all, <laughs> it's, it's a family and we love each other, okay? This is 2018. This is our mindset in 2008. Kristen writing this. I wanted to send you this letter to explain to everyone what we know and don't know about the process of adopting that we have begun. As it stands, we will soon be dual licensed foster adoptive parents. We've had to go through a lot of training and paperwork to get to this point. Thank you to all of you who have had to turn in paperwork as well. It's crazy, the amount. So here goes the explanation of what we know is likely to happen from here. So we decided that we were gonna do legal risk adoption. And what that means is some fostering or legal risk foster to adopt. Some fostering, you, your goal, well, the goal is always to get the kids back with their birth parents. But when you're just fostering, they're kind of thinking, okay, these kids need a safe place for a little bit while the parents get things sorted out, and then they will go back. Whenever you do legal risk adoption, they're basically different situations every time, but a lot of times they're saying they've been removed multiple times or the situation is dire enough that they don't feel like these kids are coming back. So they're at legal risk, meaning... If you're a foster parent, there's a good chance that these kids are gonna be, you'll have the opportunity to adopt them. So we decided to do legal risk. 
She says, now for the type of children we may receive. We've had to complete a very specific form on the children we were willing to have in our home. Not only did we choose age, range, and race, we also had to answer very specific and heart-wrenching questions about the types of disabilities. Behavior issues, physical issues, etc. That that we were willing to accept into our home. We stated on our form that we would like a child or children under the age of three, boy or girl, with minor behavior or medical issues. Basically, the underlying theme was to keep Spencer safe. We are hoping we are open to sibling groups, so there's a chance that we may be able to adopt more than one child. So now the waiting game begins. We went through classes and all this stuff, and you only get 20, so they call you, you have 24 hours to decide. And on, <laughs> on my birthday in 2008, I'm sitting outside and they call me and they say, we have, we have two kids that need a home. They're coming from a tougher situation. We don't think they're gonna go back with their families. Are you willing? And I call Kristen, <laughs> and I call Kristen, and we talk on the phone for just a second. And then I call him right back, and I said, yeah, we're going to do it. The next day, <laughs> they show up at your house. It's the strangest thing ever. They show up at your house with the kids, two bags. You don't have cribs. You don't have anything. You don't know what age. You don't know anything about anything. Showed up at our house, two bags. And I remember we fed him fish sticks and popsicles and while we signed a whole bunch of papers. And the kids just kind of like, and then we laid them down for a nap with the people who had them before. And by the time they woke up from the nap, those people were gone. And it is just, it's just crazy. At this point, we will basically be employees of the state of Texas in charge of taking the best care of these children we can and working as a part of the team to complete the best plan for these children's lives. It's also possible that the children will be allowed visits with extended family members, but most likely not the birth parents. However, once the children are legally adopted, they become ours, just like Spencer. No more caseworkers, no more paperwork, no more CPS, just ours forever. We had to move while we were fostering. God called me to another church out of state in Birmingham. So we are foster parents in the state of Texas. God calls me to Birmingham. We're in the middle of this. They're not our adopted kids. As soon as we took that job, we had the fastest court date situation. Everything just like boom, 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 faster than anybody had ever seen. We left, packed up a minivan with the kids. Stop. <laughs> Stop by the courthouse. It was finalized. Drove to Birmingham. I was actually living in Birmingham, drove back. And we're wondered about what ifs. It happens when it's God's plan. I don't know if they'll call us mom and dad. I don't, know, I don't know what we'll feel like when we meet them. I don't know how they'll react to our love and our family. I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is that this is absolutely God's plan for our lives and our family. And he does know. He does know. He does know. That's what she wrote. That's good. Amen. So the bottom line is that we are all about to go on a journey together that none of us has ever been on. We love you and need your prayers and support that everything through everything that will come along. You are on a journey. Whether you like it or not, or whether it feels like it or not, you're on a journey. You might have shut down the journey and living in that red tape life but you are on an eternal journey and God is calling you to live as if eternity exists and let it change you, let it make you crazy, let it make you do silly things. 
but let God stand right next to you and level the way because he can. So in conclusion, <laughs> what are the rocks in your life that are rocking your world that shouldn't? What are the what ifs that are holding you back from 100% of God's best life worth living? And what's it going to take for you to get over this life and get on to eternity mindset? And if you're in here today and all this is great, it feels good, and it's great to hear, and you don't know Jesus, first off, you're not the only person in here who doesn't know Jesus. Lots of people seeking, but I want to tell you, I've been, 20, I've been a Christian for over 25 years now, and it started off as a weird faith, and it's kind of proven itself over and over, and now I've just lost my mind, and I'm 100% in. But if you're in here, I want to tell you, there's a difference between Jesus and all these other things that you see people wrapped up in. And you might, you might feel like that. Are these people just making themselves feel better? There is a difference between Jesus and all these other clubs and all these other things. Jesus Christ lived a life that nobody else would have lived. When he died, the way his story played out, women, which at the time was a very strange thing, were the first ones to see that he was gone. He died. He was a martyr. He healed people with many people all around. Scholars will tell you that the Bible is more provable than Homer's Iliad. Like the things that we teach in school, the Bible, there's more proof that the Bible is a real thing and that Jesus Christ existed. It's a real thing. But I also... I also understand that Christians, sometimes religious people, mess it up. I do too. But what I want to tell you is it's not about them. It's about Jesus Christ and his love for you, his passion for you and his been the best things that you can have in your life. So if you're here today and you want to maybe faith requires action. So maybe you want to take an action. We have people that are perfectly normal people up here at the end of the service. They really are. They're nice. You'll love them. You come up and talk to him and maybe you, I never knew what to say when I became a Christian. So I'll just tell you what you can say to him when you walk up. Just say, I want to follow Jesus. That's all you got to say. And they'll lead you through all kinds of things. It's a faith journey that requires action. Take it today. Get off the fence, okay? Please. I promise you it'll be worth it. 25 years deep. You couldn't. It, my, my life is amazing because of Christ. So we'll do that, and we're going to have communion together. And for those of you who don't know, communion is a moment. Jesus actually told us to do this, where we remember the sacrifice that he made for us. Okay, so the, the juice in there, it represents blood that was poured out for us when Jesus died. And the, the cracker, it represents Jesus' body that was broken for you. So I'm going to pray. If you want to know Jesus, come down to the front after the end of the service. And all of us together, let's take communion right now. Let's pray. God, we love you. May you be real in somebody's life for the first time today, God. May those of us who are caught up in drama and just all kinds of reactions and all kinds of chaos, may we center ourselves back on you. God, for those of us that feel like we have all these rocks and boulders, would you help us to see how big they really are? God, for those of us living as if today is the most important thing, would you help us to see eternity's perspective? We want a life like Paul had. That sounds amazing, God. Take us on that journey. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.